Amen. So we're finishing up John chapter number four. We've been in John four for three weeks so far. This is the fourth week. Of course, John chapter four is most famous for the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. The whole context of the story, remember, is Jesus is traveling to Galilee. In order to get to Galilee, you have to go through Samaria. So he meets this Samaritan woman. And we get this very famous story in the Bible. Last week, we talked about um, Jesus' comments from verse 34 to verse 38, where he talks about some will sow, some will reap. And we related that to ourselves, how we will sow sometimes, we will reap sometimes. But if we sow, we know we will reap. And we just did a study through that. It's interesting, though, because if you look at verse 39, we actually see an, a perfect example of exactly what Jesus is talking about in the previous verses of sowing and reaping because the Samaritan woman, she actually goes to town and she tells people about Jesus. She tells people that she's found the Messiah, and some people believe right away. So she sows and she reaps at the same time, but some people didn't believe until Jesus stayed and talked himself. If you look at verse number 40, it says, they, so some people didn't believe, so what was she doing? She was just sowing in that case. That's somebody that you give the gospel to, and they're still thinking about it. Um, you've, got them, you know, you've got them thinking about things, they're seeking, but they just need to hear more. Maybe they need to hear from somebody else, they need to hear it again, whatever. We'll talk about that in a few minutes too. But look at verse number 41. In verse number 40, it says, they wanted him to stay. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. So Jesus stays there two days and speaks to all these people that came from town. And then look at verse 41. It says, And many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, but for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So some people needed to hear some more. So some people, you know, the woman at the, at the well, she went to town and she told people and she did sowing and reaping right there. Many people believed on him just on her word. But then Jesus had to come and do the reaping for a lot of people she sowed. So she got them to come and it's a, it's a perfect example of what Jesus is talking about to the disciples. So basically Jesus entered into the labor of that woman in, that, in this case. When you look at the soul winners um, and how things go as far as sowing and reaping. But really we're going to pick up things in uh, verse number 43, not to re-preach um, last week's sermon. We're going to look at a couple things that not only Jesus says, but things that happen at the end of this chapter. And I know we've been in this chapter for several weeks, but there's just a lot of things that go on here, and I don't want to leave anything behind. So look at verse number 43 of John chapter 4. The Bible says, now after two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee. So now Jesus finally leaves and he heads on his way into Galilee, which is where he's from, by the way. This is uh, Nazareth, is in Galilee, so Jesus is kind of going to his home country. All right, and then look at verse 44. It says, For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Now, in John chapter 4, the Bible doesn't really elaborate on this comment that he makes. So this is one of the nice things where we have other Gospels. We can go and we can look at where Jesus says this again and kind of see what he's talking about in a little bit more detail. Turn to Mark chapter 6. So the first thing I want to point out this evening is I want to kind of cut up um, what Jesus is talking about in this verse where he said that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. What is Jesus talking about and how does that apply to us? Look at Mark chapter 6 and verse number 1 we get a little bit more context on what Jesus was talking about with this statement in John chapter 4. Look at verse number 6. By the way, that's why there's four Gospels. We just see, you know, different angles. We see different details on all these different situations. That's why God gave us four different looks. None of the Gospels contradict each other. They actually fill in gaps um, for each other. They just give us more clarity on the life and ministry of Jesus. Look at verse number 1. Mark chapter 6. We're looking at this uh, comment that Jesus made in verse number 44 of John 4. And he went out from thence and came into his own country. Again, he went into Galilee. All right? He's in Galilee, and his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things, and what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is this not? Look at verse number three. So they're astonished that this is happening. And then look at what they say. Remember, these are people that know 
who Jesus was when he was growing up. Jesus didn't start his ministry until he was 33 years old. He was, he was or tell you, he was 30 years old, sorry. He, was in a, he lived for 30 years before he started anything in his ministry. If you remember John chapter 2, right before he, does, he turns the water into wine, you know, his mother comes up to him and says, they have no wine. And what does he say to her? He says, my hour has not yet come. He's like, he hasn't started his ministry yet. You know, he's not ready to start doing miracles. And of course, he did miracles right after that. But he was telling her, like, look, this is not the time just yet. All right. But look, these people knew who Jesus was. They knew who his family was. This is the point I'm trying to get across. Look at verse number three. It says, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and of Simon? So, I mean, well, first of all, I, I didn't have this in the notes, but I mean, like, did Mary have other children? I don't know. I mean, the Bible says she does. So Jesus had many brothers and sisters. And Jesus was, it doesn't say he was the son of the carpenter. He was a carpenter. He's 30 years old. I mean, he's, he's been an adult for a decade or more. He's been working. He's been living his life. Um, look, without sin, but he's not started his ministry from the time he was, you know, zero to 30. All right? So they knew who he was. And his sisters are not here with us, and they were offended at him. So here's this guy doing all these miracles all of a sudden, and they're like, this is Joseph's apprentice. What's going on here? And they're just, they were offended. They were like, who does this guy think he is? This is exactly what Jesus was talking about in verse number 44 of John chapter 4. But Jesus said unto them, uh, look at this, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. Notice this. So notice how we get more detail in this verse number 4 of Matthew chapter 6. So Jesus says his own country in John chapter 4 verse 44, but now he says among his own kin, that means relatives, and then amongst his own house, meaning Jesus is saying as people are closer to you, this theory of mine that I'm, this comment that I'm making is going to get worse. He's saying that a prophet will be of less honor <laughs> of the closer people are to him. He's saying, what Jesus' case. He says it because, you know, I mean, well, Jesus had no sin, and he's having problems with this. All right, look at verse number 5. It says that there he could do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands on upon a few sick folk and healed them, which is exactly what we see in, ver in John chapter 4, by the way. We don't see him going and, and doing some mighty work, but he does heal someone who was sick in John chapter 4. So notice how the, just the, the Gospels just fit together just perfectly, all right? But we get much more detail about what Jesus was talking about in Mark chapter 6. And finally, in verse number 6, it says, And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went round about the villages teaching. So that's the first thing I want to talk about this evening, is that, that this, is just, this is just a truth that Jesus is putting across, putting out to us, um, that, that a prophet is not without honor. It's saying, what he's saying is a prophet has honor everywhere except his hometown, or everywhere except where he came from, all right? This is a universal Christian truth right here. And this is, you will, look, if you're saved, you will see this in your life, especially if you have gotten saved later in life, this will be more of a contrast for you. This will be more of a, a truth for you. I mean, you get saved. You know, people get saved. They come to church. And what's the first thing that they do? They get saved. I mean, when you got saved, were you excited to be saved? You get saved. You're excited to be saved. And the first thing that you want, you know, you come from some sort of background that you, you, you did not come from a fundamental Baptist church if you weren't saved when you were 30 years old. And you get saved and you realize that you've been wrong and the first thing that you want to do is go to those people that you love the most, that were closest to you, and you want to get them saved too. And look, there's varying levels of success here. Some people have little to no success. Some people have a lot of success. I mean, that's not the point of this. But the point is, is that many times... Many times when you are not successful, especially, people will just not listen to you because they're from your own house, because they're from your own town. Because they'll be like, 
who's this guy? I, I've, been, I've been going to school with you for 20 years. What, what, what happened to you yesterday? You know, they're gonna just, they're gonna have the same attitude towards you that they had towards Jesus. Look, and it's worse for you because you're not sinless like Jesus was. So they're gonna look at you, and especially if you're, you know, you're, you're actually making changes in your life, they're going to look at you and they're going to be like, hey, you know, who do you think you are? You, you clean up your life a little bit and now you think you can tell me about the Bible? I mean, you're going to have difficulty. It will have, Jesus is telling this. Jesus grew up, he shifts into the ministry, and he has trouble with this. Even though, even before he was in the ministry, he was without sin. He didn't even have a foolish thought. And he had problems with this. So this is another thing that Jesus is just preparing us for, so we're not offended. I'm really glad that Jesus and the Bible and the Word of God puts these types of things in the Bible just so we can, I mean, these are things that are proofs to us. I am, I am, I'm not happy when these things happen, but it is a proof that the Bible says these things. You're like, wow, the Bible's a miracle. Wow, the Bible, how did the Bible know that would happen to me? How did the Bible know that I was going to deal with this? So there's two points that, there's two points that I want to make to you on just this point on why Jesus brings this up. Why does Jesus say this for us? The first thing is this. It's hard to be without honor. It's not an easy thing to go through. You say, I don't, I don't care about what people think about me. Everybody says that. Nobody really feels that way. <laughs> Myself included. I mean, everybody feels that way. Either, you know, especially amongst people that you have known for years, yea, sometimes decades of your life, the majority of your life, in the case of getting saved later in life, you got saved in your mid-30s or whatever, like I did. I mean, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bother you. It's going to bother you that you are without honor to people that you have known for your entire life. Because guess what? Most people care what other people think. It's a natural thing. It's a natural thing. But I mean, many people say they don't, but most people do. That's really what it comes down to. The people you knew from before are going to have many times a hard time listening to you. This is what Jesus is saying. All right? And you say, why, why is that? You say, why is that? Well, I think it's because people just have a difficult time changing. People just have a difficult time changing their mindsets. People have a hard time forgetting things. People have, you know, and I don't want to preach sermons that I'm going to preach in a few weeks, but people kind of have set ideas, and it's hard for people to get out of their set ideas. So the first thing is that it's hard to be without honor, and Jesus is kind of warning us here. Jesus is saying, look, you know, they, they hate you because they hated me. It, it's the same type of theory. He's telling us this so we won't be offended. He's like, this is going to happen to you. I'm without sin. It happened to me. Don't, don't be surprised when it happens to you because, you, you know, you're not without sin. All right? So people might actually have reasons to look at you and say, oh, you think you're some Christian now? I knew you back when you were, you know, you were doing whatever, you know? I mean, so look, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing, but... The next point I want to make, and, and, and another reason I believe Jesus tells us this, is because, because it is hard for you to testify, to spread the gospel, to um, be that witness to people from your own country, because that's difficult, your testimony is so important going forward. And that's really what you know, I want to drive home to you this evening is that your testimony is so important as you leave the old country and you go into the new country. Your testimony matters, folks. So look, start building. You know, once you get saved, you need to start building that new country, that next country, that, that country that's outside your own country. Where what? Where you do have honor. Where you do, where people do need you know, people do know you as different in that next country. And look, you not only need to build that, you know, build that testimony in that outside country, but you need to hang on to it. It's super important. 
This is a problem. This is a problem with people that want to be two different types of people. They want to be church people, and then during the week, they want to be in the world people. This is a problem because they want to act a certain way at church. They want to act like the Christian at church, and then throughout the week, they, they want people to just think they're just like them. They, this is the type of person that, that goes to work or goes to you know, uh, groups that they're in outside the church or whatever, you know, and wants to, doesn't want to look like they stick out. Doesn't want to look like they're separate from those people, even though the Bible tells us that we should be separate. But then you want the church to think, I'm like them, and you want the world to think, I'm like them. It's never going to work. First of all, situational ethics are nowhere in the Bible. You know, this is like the person that thinks, oh, I can, I can dress like a certain way at the beach, but they don't think that it would be appropriate to wear that to Walmart. Walmart's a bad example, like the mall or something, because what people wear to Walmart is not appropriate anywhere. But the point is, is that if it's wrong there, it's wrong here. If it's wrong here, it's wrong there. This is the type of people that think, uh, I, I, you know, kids can't watch this unless they're past 17 years old. You know, R-rated movies or whatever, you know, you, you, you got to be 17 to watch. That, that's nowhere in the Bible. If it's wrong for an adult, it's wrong for a child. If it's wrong for a child, it's wrong for an adult. Morality in the Bible and God's rules in the Bible, if it's, you know, if it's wrong for them, it's wrong for you. That's what the Bible says. But, you know, we're just taught all these situational ethics today to be this person there and this person there. That is nowhere in the Bible. We must protect our testimony because the problem is if you're trying to be a certain person here and a certain person here, eventually you will mix them up. If you're trying to be a Christian at church and then you're trying to be, you know, like the world at, at work or wherever else you are, you're going to slip up at some point. I mean, there's some people out there that literally, this is like the ultimate fake person, right? They just try to be everything to everybody. No matter, I mean, they're like a chameleon. Whatever group that they're in, I mean, there's Christians like this. It's pitiful. Whatever group that they're in, they try to just fit in with that group, whether they're in the world, over here, in the world, over there, at church, over here, whatever. But the point is this, you will lose credibility on both sides as a Christian, if you do not protect your testimony as a Christian, you will have honor nowhere. Because the Christians will think you're a joke. The Christians will think you're fake. And the worldly people will think your Christianity is a joke. This is the person that gets saved and has principles on Tuesday through, you know, uh, Tuesday of the next month and then, you know, goes and is worldly. And all you're doing, you think... You're appeasing the world in that case, Christian. What you're doing is you're making, you know, you're, you're troddening Jesus Christ underfoot in front of everybody else. You are literally making your religion as a joke. And you know what? Those people that might take you seriously, if they see your testimony played out for year after year after year, and be like, oh, man, this isn't a fad. And he is serious about this. Look, it takes time. It takes time, and it takes consistency. That is the best opportunity many of these people that are close to you are going to have to finally realize that maybe there is something to this. But that takes time. That takes time. And look, overall, many of the people close to you just may never show honor. But at least keep the honor in the next country that you go to. Protect your testimony. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Guard those riches. You know, they're important. Once they're lost, it's really hard to get them back. Guard your testimony because you, you may have no honor in your own country, but at least you'll have honor in the country that you're going to if you're fake and you're trying to play both sides. You'll have no honor anywhere. Protect your testimony. And then you'll have honor everywhere going forward. That's the nice thing about it. And guess what? This idea is much easier for the second generation. 
It is much harder for the people that leave the old country. But guess what? For our children, for the next generation, they're going to have honor in, in they're going to have honor in our country, in the country they go to. They're going to have honor there. I mean, it's 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 hard. It's hard to go through that, but Jesus is telling us, hey, even I went through it. Turn back to John chapter 4. Turn back to John chapter 4. I mean, the old country, and here's another thing. Don't look back on the old country and lament it. And look, I catch myself doing this. Don't look back on the old country and lament it. And lament that you don't have that honor back there. We're supposed to look forward and move forward Amen. in this Christian life. Look at John chapter 4 and verse number 45. Now we see a story where Jesus um, does a miracle here. And I want to show you some things that will help us um, to pray better and more effectively this evening. Look at verse number 45. It says, when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made, wa made the water wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judah into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So his son didn't have a flu or a cold. His son was about to die. Look at verse number 48, though. I have verse number 48, like, circled in my Bible, because this is kind of a prophecy right here. All right, in verse number 48, I mean, it's a prophecy that is quickly fulfilled. But look at verse 48 where it says, Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. And that, I mean, if you just read through this real quick, you kind of miss this. But look at verse 48 where Jesus tells this man, Unless ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. So what does he mean by believe there? I'm going to explain that to you. Look at verse 49. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. He's asking him, Come save my child. Verse 40, or verse uh, 50. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. So you have this man saying, Come to my house and heal my son. And Jesus says, You have to understand what's happening here. Jesus says, Your son's healed. Like nobody's at the house. Nobody is at Jesus or the, this nobleman's house. Jesus just says, It's done. And notice... In verse number 51, no, I'm sorry, um, in verse number 50, it says, And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him. Does that say the man believed on Jesus as the Messiah? No, it says he believed that his son was healed. So that's a super important point here, because Jesus, in verse 48, he says, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. What is Jesus talking about there? He's talking about believing on him as the Messiah. And what did this man need to see? He needed to see signs and wonders. But in verse number 50, it says, he believed that his son was healed. It does not say that he believed on Jesus as the Christ. And I'm going to prove that to you in a couple verses. Look at verse 51. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, thy son liveth. Verse 52. Then inquired he of them the hour which he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So they tell him the he got better at one o'clock yesterday. And then this man in his head, he, he's like, what time did I talk to Jesus? And it was at, at that exact same hour. Look at verse 53. And so the father knew that it was the same hour. So get, are you seeing the picture here? Basically, he, Jesus says, your son is healed. And the man starts going home. And the servants meet him, and they say, your son is healed. Your son is healed. And he said, what time was he healed? And he said, I mean, it must have been a, a, a decent, you know, a day's travel or whatever to his house. And they said he was healed yesterday at 1 o'clock, which is exactly the same time that Jesus said, your son is healed. So then he knew that it was Jesus for sure. And then look what it says. It says, in that he knew it was that same hour, and that Jesus said unto him, thy son liveth. And look at this. And himself believed, and his whole house believed what? Now they believed on Jesus Christ. You see that? That's the prediction from verse number 48. Jesus says, you won't believe on me until you see signs and wonders. So what does he do? He does signs and wonders, and he believes on him. So Jesus 
basically calls it in verse number 48. I mean, that's a great proof that you know, Jesus is God again. But he calls that this man would not believe on him until he did this miracle. It's very similar to the Samaritan woman where some people just believe right away. But you know what? Some people needed to hear from themselves. Look, it's better to believe right away. But I guess it's, better, it's, it's best if you eventually just believe. And this is the second miracle that Jesus did when he has come out of Judea into Galilee. Turn to Luke chapter 5. I want to give you some common denominators here on the miracles of Jesus. I want to give you two. One main common denominator that we see here in John chapter 4. But the first thing you have to see is that his son was healed and the man believed Jesus that he healed his son. Okay, so the man believed that Jesus could heal his son. But he needed to see that before he believed on Jesus. So there's two types of belief at the end of John chapter 4. Okay, so every time we say believe in the Bible, it's kind of like every time the word saved comes up in the Bible. It's not talking about being spiritually saved. Matthew 24 is talking about being saved from being killed, like physically. So every time it says believed in the Bible or unbelief in the Bible, it's not necessarily talking about just salvation or damnation. It's, look, you know, you as a saved believer tonight, you can have unbelief in your life. And that's what I'm going to explain to you this evening. And you should not pray. I don't want to give away the answer, but you should not be praying in unbelief. You, what do you mean unbelief? That Jesus is the Christ? No, you're never going to have that unbelief. What if I stop believing? You're never going to stop believing. If you're saved and you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, you're never going to stop believing that Jesus died for your sins and that you're saved. You're never going to stop believing that. Why would you? Why would you? It's like, it's like you can't forget that fire is hot if you've ever touched something that's hot. It's the same type of thing. But you can have unbelief. You can have unbelief that God can do something for you. You can pray, and you can pray, and you can say the words as you pray, not believing that God's really going to do anything to help you. But let's look at some of the common things that all people that Jesus healed. And I mean, look, we can't look at all of them. Look, look at Luke chapter 5. Look at verse number 18. Behold, the men brought in a bed, which a man was taken with the palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. When they could not find what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they began, they went upon the housetop, and they let him down through the, t through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And look at this. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Turn to Luke chapter 7. So what did they have? They had faith. They had faith that Jesus could heal them. And look, we don't know if that faith right there meant they believed Jesus was the Messiah, but even if they had the faith that he was the Messiah, they definitely had the faith that Jesus could heal him. Look at verse number 1 of Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. And when he ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a certain centurion servant, this is a Roman, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die, and when he heard of Jesus, he sent him unto the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him, saying that he was worthy for, who, for whom he should do this, for he loved our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. So this is a Roman, but he seems to be a good man. The Jews are um, they're advocating for this person. Look at verse 6. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was not too far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter unto my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I, my, I, I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. So I mean, at first, if you just glance over this, you could say, okay, the guy wants Jesus to heal his servant, and he won't even go out and personally talk to Jesus. He won't even go. But no, the man was being sincere. The man was literally, I mean, he was sincere. He's like, I am not worthy to stand in front of you. I'm not worthy for you to come visit me. He's saying, just say it in a word and my servant shall be healed. So he wasn't looking for the easy way. He literally just had the faith that Jesus could speak it into happening. Look at verse 8. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and another come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. So he's basically saying, I know you have, you know, the power to command this servant to be healed. And look what Jesus says. Jesus recognizes this, and he says, Jesus heard these things. He marveled at him, and he turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. 
He's saying, I'm see, I see such greater belief in this man than I do in the Jews, in Israel. Look at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, look at verse number 19. So what is the common thing that we see with all of these miracles is that these people at the very least, all of these people at the very least had faith that Jesus could heal them, had faith that he could do it. Look at verse 19. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman, which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years, came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. What does that show? That shows that she had absolute faith that all she had to do was touch Jesus, and he could heal her. Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. What has made you whole? Thy faith has made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that very hour. Turn to Matthew chapter 17. So look, folks, I'm going to give you two keys to prayer tonight. And the first one is faith. The first one is belief. Look at Matthew chapter 17 and verse number 14. Jesus actually says, though, that there's two. And I'm going to show you what those two are. Look at Matthew chapter 17, verse number 14. Every single time Jesus healed somebody, the person that he healed had faith that he could do it. And in the case of John chapter 4, the guy had faith that he could do it, and then he had faith on Jesus Christ. He had faith on him as the Messiah. Look at verse 14. When they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. This is somebody the disciples couldn't handle, and Jesus had to come do it himself. And he tells, this is such a great story, because he tells the disciples why they were not able to do it. So you ever wonder, like, if you're ever wondering, like, why isn't God answering my prayers? Why am I not able to get God to listen to me? Pay attention here. Look at this, verse 15. Lord, have mercy on my son. He's a lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to my, and I brought him to my disciples. They could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither, me, hither to me. So this guy brought him to the disciples. They couldn't do anything to help him. And Jesus rebuked. So, I mean, what did, we see the problem in verse 18. He was not just a lunatic. I mean, he was possessed by a demon. Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said, What? Because of your unbelief. Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. It's interesting because this is a hard thing to do. You say, oh, this is easy. All I have to do is just believe that, that Jesus can do anything. It's a hard thing to do. Because tell me that you don't say prayers in unbelief. Tell me that when you say a prayer, there's not, you know, when you're asking for something, even if it's something that's good that you think God would want, tell me that there's not a part of you sometimes that says, man, is God really going to do this for me? Can God really do this for me? This is exactly what the disciples were dealing with. And then look at verse 21. He says, how be it, this kind go out, but by prayer and fasting. But they were praying in unbelief. So if you look at verse 50 of John chapter 4, the first belief the guy had was the belief that God could heal his son. Jesus said unto him, verse 50, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him. What word? That thy son liveth. And he went his way. He just believed that Jesus could do it. And then he believed that Jesus is the Messiah. So I guess the first question is, do you believe God can answer your prayers when you pray? Or are you praying in unbelief? Don't pray in unbelief. Pray believing that God can answer your prayers. Look, you got to just look at it this way. God may not answer all your prayers the way you want them answered, but he can answer all your prayers. God can do anything that he wants to do, so it makes no sense even though our flesh and our, our view of this world has corrupted us, just like it corrupted the disciples. But don't pray in unbelief. Pray in belief. That's the first thing. Pray in 
belief. And the third one, or the second one is this. He says there's two things, prayer and fasting. But what is he talking about with fasting? So look at verse number 21. It says, how be it, I'm sorry, I'm still in Matthew 17. He says, how be it, this kind go out, but by prayer and fasting. So by prayer, where he's assuming that you can believe by praying, you believe that God can do it, and fasting. What does that mean? Fasting is sacrifice. Fasting is showing sacrifice. Fasting is showing obedience to God. So you need to pray. You need to pray in belief and in obedience to God. I mean, fasting is just one way to show sacrifice and obedience. So the second key, key to prayer is, is obedience. So basically, ask in faith all your prayers and ask in obedience all your prayers. Ask in faith. Believing, that's what that means. Believing God can answer your prayer. Don't just be this taker. What does obedience have to do with it? Because you're, I'm going to be this guy that just lives however I want to live, and then when I need to dial 911 to God, I'm going to call him up. And you know, look, that's not fasting. That's not obedience. And look, I, I have a hard time believing that somebody who's not obedient to the Lord is going is to be praying in belief to the Lord. But if you pray in belief and in obedience... This is how Jesus wants you to pray. This was the problem with why they couldn't cast out this devil. Because they didn't believe that he could do it. Don't just be this taker in your life. Don't just be this person that's going to take your salvation and think that you're just going to call up God whenever you want in any kind of emergency. You're never going to talk to God unless you need something, first of all. It's kind of like, you know, the person that never calls, you know, his relatives or whatever, never calls his parents unless he needs money. Don't be that person with God. That's not an obedience. That's not fasting. That's not sacrifice. This is not going to do much for your odds of getting your prayers answered the way you want them answered. This is what Jesus is telling. Don't be this person that just wants something but gives nothing is what Jesus is teaching us. You know, your life should be a living sacrifice. In Romans chapter 12. So the Bible here is saying, like, pray properly. Pray in belief. And look, it's better. It would have been better if that guy in John chapter 4 would have just believed that Jesus was the Messiah without seeing anything. Without Jesus even having to say verse number 48. But he had to show him a miracle. This is why Jesus did the miracles. Because he knew that there's always going to be these secondary people that needed to see the miracles. They needed to see these things in order to have that faith that he was the Messiah. And look, he was willing to do it. But we get some nice application of how we should be bringing things to the Lord in prayer tonight. When you pray to God, look, God can do anything. It doesn't mean he's going to do anything for you. It doesn't mean, and I mean, the Bible even says that the Holy Spirit, when you pray for stupid things, the Holy Spirit is going to like retranslate that to God and tell God what you really need. So you may have some problem in your life. This is such a beautiful thing about being saved. You might have some problem in your life and you think, oh, I have the solution. Maybe it's just right for us to pray and tell God the problem and ask him if he can get us out of the problem instead of like coming up with this concocted you know, cockamamie plan that we think is going to work that the Holy Spirit has to retranslate to God. Bring a problem to God. Believe that he can fix it. Live your life in obedience to him as a sacrifice to him, and it's going to work out just fine. That's what Jesus is telling us here. So that's John chapter 4. We made it. John chapter 5, back to Jerusalem next week. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.